I would like to call to order the March 21st, 2019 meeting for the Johnson County Community College Board of Trustees to order. If you will all stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening. Thank you all for being here this evening. We would like to begin with the roll call and recognition of visitors. Mrs. Okay. Leach. This evening's visitors include Dave Shecker, Pam Stranahan, Melissa McIntyre, Roberta Eveslage, Ryan Colston, Mary Lynn Poskin, Dick Carter, and Jamia Haynes. Thank you very much. Okay, Dr. Subject, we will begin with the words and recognitions. Uh, thank you, Trustee Ingram. Uh, tonight we have with us some very special guests from the Gardner Edgerton USD 231 District, um, Superintendent Pam Stranahan and Melissa McIntyre, who's the coordinator of Student Support Services. Uh, I, Come on up. <laughs> All right. Four, I, I wow, you, you're way, way ahead of the script here. Um, before we get started, I'd like to read a little bit about your district. Okay. Um, we all know Gardner Edgerton is in the southwest corner of Johnson County. Uh, the district serves approximately 6,100 students. Um, which includes, and, and they are um, in seven elementary schools, three middle schools, and one high school. In 2016, uh, patrons uh, of that community approved a $29.7 million bond for high school addition, a standalone advanced technical center, which is really a fantastic structure, as we've had the good fortune of, of visiting, and a trails facility and capital improvements. <clears throat> Gardner Edgerton is home to three national blue ribbon schools and competes academically at regional, state, and national competitions. Now I'd like to read a little bit about its um, terrific superintendent. Is that... Pam holds a bachelor's of education degree from Fort Hay State University and a master's in education from Texas Women's University. Uh, she began her career in education at Fort Hay State University as an assistant instructor and graduate student in the kinesiology department in 1987. Pam came to Gardner, Kansas in 2008, accepting the position of assistant principal at Gardner Edgerton High School. Um, she, has, she was then promoted to district office as an assistant director of secondary education, and then in 2010, she was promoted to, the, to be director of educational services for secondary education. Pam has held this, held this position until she was appointed interim superintendent in February 2014 and became superintendent in February 2015. A rather meteoric career rise, Pam. Congratulations. <laughs> Pam has presented professionally at state and national conferences on topics including Common Core, cyberbullying, special education modification, benchmark testing, positive behavior modification, new environmental interdisciplinary units, crisis communication, gang identification, grant writing, cooperative learning, classroom management, and technology-based classrooms. How do you have time to be a superintendent when you're writing these presentations all the time? I just don't sleep at night. There you go. <laughs> Well, Pam, welcome, you and Melissa. Thank you so much for, for joining us this evening. Um, thank you for this terrific partnership that we have. It benefits truly, um, hopefully, all of our students, and we're very, very um, focused on student success. So it's our pleasure to honor you this evening. Thank you. small token of our appreciation to you this evening. Thank you very much for being here. Um, but I think there are many of us as, as we've kind of learned more about our community and the different school districts that contribute to having students here at Johnson County Community College, we realize the value of our continued contributions amongst ourselves, but certainly the conversations that we have that really work to strengthen our community. So thank you very much. This is a timepiece that will reflect the time that we've spent together and the time that we look forward to spending together in the future. So thank you very much for being here tonight. If you'd like to say a few words, yeah. we'd love to have you. So um, I just want to say thank you. I want to say thank you. Uh, it's, it's kind of interesting coming in here because I look out in the audience and the number of people that are sitting out here that we have had relationships with and then the people that are sitting around up here 
it's uh, absolutely amazing. And since I came into the district, I've had the pleasure of continually every year working with Johnson County Community College staff and students at times and coming over, doing observations, looking, getting feedback, asking questions. And I just can't say enough about our partnership and how um, strong it is and how much I believe the importance of that. And as we continue to keep moving forward, just even recently, we've been working on adding pathways, which include the fire safety. And we're beginning to have further conversations also, not just with our CNA programs and our fire safety and all the other career pathways, but looking at more of pathways such as your cosmetology on how we can start bringing students to you that are at the point in their, their high school careers where they want to go on into that career avenue. So those are just a few things that we have worked with you all, but I cannot tell you enough thank yous of how much that partnership's important. And it's not just important to the adults, it's important to what we're offering and we're providing to our students. Um, one quick uh, scenario I'll give you that I think nobody else in Johnson County has done is we offered a career class that was at our alt school because we saw that our alt school population was not going on to college. They were, they were really not. They were finishing school, their credits, and being done with it. And we started offering a few years ago, three years ago, is that right, Melissa? Um, a college career credit to them. And I went back and checked numbers, and our first group of 10 students that took that class and enrolled with you all, nine of those 10 continued on with you all. I think that's huge that we changed their pathways moving forward. And so that's a small part. I'm gonna have Melissa just talk for a couple of minutes because I want her to give you some numbers. Uh, Melissa has been on this ride with me since I came into the district, and sometimes I think unwilling, right? I'm like, <laughs> I'll say I have a vision, and she'll look at me like, oh, here comes that vision. And um, so, but I so appreciate all that she does for our students, and I would, I just wanted to share some numbers with you because I think they're important to hear. Um, I had shared some with you before the meeting, and I think it's kind of impressive to know how many of our students you really impact. So. Prior to taking on my role as coordinator of student services, I was a high school counselor in Gardner, um, and I have been the College Now representative for 20 years uh, here at Johnson County Community College. Um, and as a parent and as a counselor, I cannot tell you how valuable that is to our students out in Gardner. Um, I'm always very proud to have uh, the ability to offer that to them. Um, on a personal note, uh, for my students, who I consider my kids and my own personal children, the, the recent change in the requirement to get into college algebra, sorry, this is just fresh on my mind. Um, thank you so, so much, because it really is reaching a, a lot of students. Parents are excited, kids are excited. Uh, it's a big deal because some of our kids are really good in the classroom. They may be straight A students, but just didn't hit that ACT score, and it was a barrier. Um, so while I have this unique opportunity, I wanted to thank you for that. 36% uh, of our graduating seniors attend Johnson County Community College. So this facility is very important to our community. Um, and um, as Pam said, we look forward to continue to grow our partnership with you and, and appreciate everything you do for us. I'd now like to introduce Karen Martley, our <coughs> Vice President of Continuing Education and Organizational Development. Karen, I believe you're going to, to introduce the next awardee. Yes. Um, Janice, if you'd like to come forward. Tonight I want to recognize Janice Blancet. Uh, Janice is the Director of our adult uh, Johnson County Adult Education Program in the Continuing Ed Branch. She joined us in 2008. We're so fortunate to have her join our team. And, and I'm going to share a little about her because she never lets me do this. She always likes to stay behind the scenes. Um, Janice uh, serves right at around 1,500 students a year in her program. And to, to kind of put that in perspective for you, there are 20 adult education programs in the state of Kansas that are um, under KBOR. And out of those 20 locations, Janice serves 15%, um, excuse me, 15% of those students, correct? 
um, or no, 20% 20 of those, 20, 25. 25 now percent of those students. So she sees large groups of students assisting them with basic instruction, whether it's English language skills, whether it's assisting them with soft skills in the curriculum, um, or um, uh, basic kinds of life skills to help them be successful but also really provides her and her team a really good safety net for students. So if they hit that hurdle that might be financial or um, utilities or housing or childcare, whatever it may be, her team is always trained and up to speed on those resources, which allows for the success of the students as well too. Um, so this year at the annual meeting of the uh, adult education in the state in Wichita, and that was in February, Janice received the Distinguished Service Award. And this award recognizes individuals who demonstrate outstanding service, promoting, developing, or implementing adult education in the state of Kansas. Um, the state of Kansas program is in the top 15% in the nation. And I believe it's Janice and her team play a big role in the success of what happens in the state. And I don't know anyone more deserving of this award than you, Janice. So on behalf of JCCC, congratulations. Thank you very much. I, I really am honored to receive this award, and I'm very honored to be invited to be here this evening as well. Um, adult education is something that's very near and dear to my heart, and um, as I talk with my counterparts throughout Kansas, they all talk about feeling like second-class citizens within the institutions that sponsor them, and that is not the case here. So when I think of my team, and this award belongs to my team, my team is not just the, the instructors, and the students and the volunteers within JCAE, but it's the entire JCCC family. Um, every department just bends over backwards to support us and to help us and delivers quality work, very timely. So that enables us to do the best we can do for our students and for the community. And so for that, I thank you very sincerely. Um, I'm really honored to be a part of the JCCC community. Thank you. Janice, I just wanted to share that it is really a pleasure to honor you here this evening. There has just never been a time when your kindness and professionalism and just everything about you hasn't been evident. You're just a very gracious woman. Um, those of us who have attended the GED graduation would say it's one of our favorite nights of the year. I remember when I was encouraged to go to that graduation and I didn't really know what to expect and it I've never missed one since, and I'm sure everyone else is in agreement too once they go. But anyway, I wanted to thank you for making the decision to come to Johnson County Community College as well. As we celebrate our 50th year, it's people like you that we're happy to have here. And again, just thank you on behalf of all of us. So, thank you, Justin. You're welcome. Okay, does anyone have anything else they wanted to share? All right, uh, the next order of business is the open forum. And the open forum is a section of the board agenda, uh, is a time for members of the community to provide comments to the board. There will be one open forum period during each regularly scheduled board meeting. Comments are limited to five minutes unless a significant number of people plan to speak. In that instance, the chair may limit a person's comments to less than five minutes. In order to be recognized, individuals must register at the door at each board meeting prior to the open forum agenda item. When addressing the board, registered speakers are asked to remain at the podium, should be respectful and civil, and are encouraged to address individual personnel or student matters directly with the appropriate college department. As a practice, the college does not respond in this setting when the matter concerns personnel or student issues or matters that are being addressed through our established grievance or suggestion processes or, or otherwise the subject of review by the college or the board. And this evening we do have one speaker and that is Anna Lim. And Anna, if you would go ahead and introduce yourself and your name and your city and your state. My name is Anna Lim and I'm a resident of Kansas City, Missouri. Before I begin, I would like to express my profound gratitude for the opportunity to address the distinguished members of the board. For some time now, I have wanted to participate in the open forum section 
of the Board of Trustees meeting to highlight the wonderful experiences that I have gained working as a student ambassador at the front desk of the President's Office. I began to work as a student ambassador in October 2016, which was also my first semester at JCCC. As a non-traditional student, I was determined to rebuild the academic discipline I needed to thrive as a college student, but I did not realize at the time that to thrive, I needed the support of a community on campus, which I could identify as my own. The opportunity to work as a student ambassador in the presence office helped me realize that a student's successful learning outcomes reflect effective institutional policies that promote lively student engagement on campus, fostering a tangible sense of community in which a student like myself can identify with these words, I belong here. Working in the President's Office as a student ambassador for the past few years gave me the chance to see glimpses of the ongoing hard work that goes into developing policies that benefit the diverse body of JCCC students. Furthermore, what I have witnessed and learned taught me that it takes a specific kind of type of leadership. It takes servant leadership. The servant leadership at JCCC impacted my academic professional and personal growth tremendously. Being one of the estimated 14% of the non-traditional students enrolled in community colleges, the odds of success were not in my favor as approximately 67% of non-traditional students overall in higher education do not complete their degrees. However, the opportunity to work as a student ambassador in the presence office under the excellent mentorship and supervision empowered my resolve to thrive as a college student. Most importantly, I learned to critically examine the meaning of success, which I realized exceeds its material aspects. The experiences I have gained in the presence office and here at JCCC helped me learn what George Washington Carver stated once. It is not the style of clothes one wears, nor the amount of money one has in the bank that counts. These mean nothing. It is simply service that measures success. I wanted to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Sopcic, the Board of Trustees, and all the servant leaders of JCCC for all their hard work in ensuring transformative learning opportunities for all students. I will always strive to serve others as you have so faithfully served us. Thank you so much. <laughs> There's a board of trustees up here and many of us in the room who see your smile every day. Thank you. That was absolutely precious. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, that does conclude the open forum as we just had one speaker this evening. So thank you very much, Anna. We appreciate you being here. The next item on the agenda is a student senate report and there will be no report as this is spring break. And we understand Mr. Harris Webster is off on spring break. So we will look forward to seeing him next month. We'll move on to the college lobbyist report and Mr. Carter. I'm ready for spring break. <laughs> that doesn't occur until uh, April 5th for the Kansas <laughs> legislature. So uh, a couple more weeks of, of in the trenches. Uh, I think you have my written comments. I just wanted to update you on a few things. Um, that are very timely, that have happened uh, even as late as uh, a few minutes ago. The, uh, when we talked last time, the legislature was approaching their first turnaround deadline, and they, uh, they did complete that, that turnaround deadline at the end of February and took a few days break for um, really not much production of bills that, that went through either body. We're coming up on this Friday is the last day uh, for committees to meet and produce uh, any bills to be worked on the House floor. There's not a lot of work product out there even this time around. Um, right now on general orders in the House of Representatives, there are approximately 45 bills. 
Um, that's not a lot of, of uh, legislation to be working through that body. The Senate has been going on general orders a little bit more often. Um, there's not a lot of, of um, bills out there in, either in committees uh, or in, that will be products of a conference committee. And so that, that uh, produces a very interesting um, end of the, of the regular part of the session, and that's essentially what we'll have is first adjournment on April 5th. So next week, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, the House and Senate will be on the floor all day long. Uh, as you can tell, it doesn't take um, a lot of time to work through some of those bills. Um, their work will likely be done fairly early. They take a couple of days off to allow staff to um, put together conference committee reports and, uh, and come back that following week to, to do some of that action. So we'll see what happens that during that first week of of April. They take off then for the month of April. They consider that their spring break. The budget committees come back at the end of April to begin discussing omnibus uh, budget items, things that, that wrap up the regular budget, if, if we're there, uh, and, and then are scheduled to go through 90 days on May 17th. Um, depending on what heavy issues are, are remaining out there, um, they could go beyond uh, that May 17th uh, date. That's already a late adjournment for the legislature anyhow. It's typically a little bit earlier. Um, the start was a little bit later. They banked some days uh, off for their breaks um, so that they could use those days at the end of the session should they need to uh, for some of the heavier uh, issues. Um, the Senate budget uh, was just passed while we were sitting in this room uh, on an emergency final action vote of 21 to 18. For us, that means um, the governor's budget recommendations for higher education plus five million uh, that would be spread out over the system. That's spread out over 36 institutions based on the formula that the uh, Board of Regents uses for, for new dollars. So that doesn't mean a whole lot of uh, dollars flowing to the community college sector. However, um, the Senate did include in their budget discussions um, a provide, or not a proviso, but a, a conversation item for later in Omnibus to look at um, an additional $33 million for higher ed. Um, should those dollars be uh, available or at least have that conversation when they return uh, later in May. That's where, that's where things are at with the Senate version of the budget. Uh, the House just passed its budget out of committee, I think, yesterday, and uh, they will be uh, taking up their budget at some point or not. We don't know um, what the plan is for, for when they'll discuss the budget. The House version of the budget has an extra $10 million over the governor's budget recommendations. So they took the governor's budget recommendations for higher education, added $10 million to that, um, had a discussion a little bit about um, some non-tiered uh, recentering um, for some of those courses. Again, it's only on new dollars. And so we'll see what that breakout looks like when the House has their, their budget debate. We're a long ways from, from being finished with the regular portion of the budget. Um, that, uh, hopefully they will get to that. Uh, they have plenty of time to deal with it over the next um, uh, three days of next week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Uh, some, of the, some of the heavier issues that uh, were on the agenda actually kind of came up yesterday. And I'll talk about that as it, as it impacts the overall budget. So we've talked a little bit about the CAPERS repayment. Um, the House and Senate both passed Senate Bill 9 uh, unanimously. The governor has signed that bill. That makes the $115 million payment to CAPERS from the missed payment plus the interest. Uh, you can take that out of the ending balance of the current year. The um, Senate and House both passed um, a version of a tax policy bill, uh, Senate Bill 22, and that has a price tag of close to $207 million. And uh, that includes a, a number of different things uh, in, that, in that measure. Uh, governor's not in favor of it. She hasn't publicly stated that she'll veto it. Uh, I think that, that that's the potential uh, in the coming weeks. We'll see what happens. I think that uh, some of the lawmakers are ready to come back with a different tax um, product, tax package. Uh, so we'll see if that actually happens. Yesterday, um, we had a um, lively and lengthy uh, debate on Medicaid expansion via an amendment on the House floor. That passed the House uh, this morning on final action, 69 to 53 or 54. I don't remember the final, final number for that, but that heads over to the Senate now. Uh, it's unknown how the Senate will receive Medicaid expansion. 
Um, their, their leadership is not in favor of it. Uh, essentially, the House leadership is not in favor of it either, but through a um, series of procedural moves, uh, it made its way through, through that body and over to, uh, over to the Senate. It is the governor's plan on Medicaid expansion. Uh, that will have uh, some price tag to it. I, I think that uh, both the House and the Senate in their budget committee process um, removed some of the expansion money uh, in the budget, um, but part of the provisions that are included in the, in the measure that passed uh, allow for some repayment uh, that will s somewhat cover the cost of, of the expansion piece overall. Um, the Senate education plan uh, looks very similar to the governor's education uh, recommendations. It's $90 million a year for the next four years. The House plan, um, as of this afternoon, was still in committee. I'm sure they're going to be kicking it out uh, today. Uh, is very different, uh, has a lot of language in it that, that doesn't necessarily add to the bottom line uh, dollar amount. Uh, it does put some money into uh, K-12 education, uh, not quite as much as what the Senate does, uh, and plays around a little bit uh, with uh, where you can go to school. We'll just leave it at that. So that's kind of where things are with respect to um, budgetary issues uh, that kind of impact the entire discussion of, of where we end up. I do want to spend some time talking about the, the Community College Transparency Bill. Uh, that's House Bill 2144 that came out earlier in the session. Uh, when it initially came out, I reported to you that it had a, a, an incredibly onerous uh, piece in there that would have curtailed some of your local authority uh, to make budget decisions on, on campus without going to, to some type of referendum. That, that component of the bill came out. So the bill simply is addressing transparency issues. We, I, uh, we already include most of the information on our website uh, that, is, that is requested in the bill. But we noticed uh, when we were reviewing the bill, um, uh, staff noticed that there were some issues that, that might be difficult to comply with uh, by the time the bill was enrolled, um, should, it, should it pass. And so we orchestrated some amendments with the Senate Education Committee that would um, extend the implementation date to July 1, uh, 2020, which would give uh, not only our college, but all, 18, uh, all 19 community colleges the opportunity to make necessary changes within their system uh, to comply with, with some of the uh, requirements. One of them was uh, to detail out the fees on the billing statement that students uh, or, or people who are uh, taking classes receive. Each community college has a different billing system. Many of them are legacy billing systems, meaning that they have just been added on to uh, over, over the years. Uh, and could be incredibly expensive to replace if, if um, administrators had to do that at each one of the community colleges. In the end, uh, the decision was made to place a statement on the, on the billing um, statement that provided a link to the website where all of the fees would be listed rather than having to break out each individual fee on the, on the individual statement. Uh, so that was something that, uh, that we were able to work through uh, as well as some clarification on just specifically what legislators were looking for uh, for the data that they wanted uh, to be added to, to the websites. That passed out of uh, committee uh, as I was leaving Topeka. I left the committee after the, the committee action occurred. They, the amendments occurred today, and that bill passed out and will be on Senate general orders um, for, for the Senate to work. The final thing that uh, I wanted to just mention is uh, please take time, if, if you haven't already, to look at the letter of support for, from the business community that's attached at the, at the uh, back end of the report. Uh, you might recognize some business names from, from around the local community as well as, as some of the uh, CEO uh, business leaders. Uh, that is something that is not uncommon. Uh, it doesn't happen every year, uh, but uh, with, the, with the focus on uh, workforce development, the role that higher education plays in that, um, there was a request for the business community to step up and, um, and offer their support for the higher education budget. And so uh, that is at the conclusion of the report. I think, Madam Chair, I would stop there and um, attempt to answer any questions that there might be. Okay. Do any of my fellow colleagues have any questions? I have a quick question on the so-called transparency bill. It also requires publication in a newspaper. Is that once a year, once a semester? Mm -hmm. How, how detailed is that? Uh, we've, we've had issues with 
publication costs before that we've tried to avoid by simply putting on the website? Yeah, I, I believe all of those components are out, that it's just website ba web based information. As I was leaving to head over here, I walked out with one of the appropriations members who asked me if we were okay with recentering. And then in the context of the House appropriations you mentioned, recentering, what, what does that mean? So uh, it, it changes the way the new dollars are distributed amongst the 19 <coughs> community colleges uh, for new dollars for non tiered courses. And there are several tables out there. Um, that, which makes the issue confusing. My understanding is from the conversation that occurred earlier this week that um, we, we do not lose. There were very few scenarios where Johnson County Community College would lose any dollars. Um, some institutions do. We gain on the, on the one that, that was discussed. That's far from being um, complete. Uh, that, will, that will definitely be part of the conference committee discussion. Um, and. So uh, I, all I can say is we are a winner. Well, good. Well, Seward County apparently is not. I, that there are there were at one point I saw uh, three or four colleges that were not. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Carter, it seems to me that I think you say as much in your letter that not much happened the first half of the session, but then that we're going to go into overtime. What, what did we do the first half of the session? <laughs> there were not a lot of bills produced out of uh, legislative committees uh, and um, not a lot of bills of um, substance. So is there somebody that wants it this way? Like to fast track the second part of the session so the bills can't be heard? I think frequently we find ourselves waiting for consensus revenue estimates to come in in April to make some of the larger budgetary decisions. Uh, and that drives a lot of the conversations on many of the other pieces uh, that are out there. So whether it's addressing issues in, in um, a foster care system with additional dollars, whether it's looking at where Medicaid expansion goes. Um, obviously, I think, that, um, I think that the legislature will be revisiting tax policy. So there are some of those issues. There's a difference between um, leadership in the legislature and um, the administration on where where they want to end up and so I think it's a fairly common fairly common practice uh, between the legislature and the administration I mean I, I run a small business I just couldn't imagine having my employees sit around the first half of the day and then ask to work overtime so I'd comment Thank we you. hurry up and wait a lot in Topeka I don't believe there are any further questions. Mr. Carter, thank you as always. We appreciate you being here. Okay, we will move on to committee reports and recommendations. Uh, Dr. Cook was scheduled to give the audit committee meeting report, but I will do that in his absence. The audit committee met at 8 a.m. on Thursday, March 15th. We had a report on the cloud and hostess, hosted computing strategies assessment and Rochelle Boyd introduced Barry Dunn consultants, Clinton Davies and Chris Ellingwood, who presented via conference call the results of the assessment. Regarding the business continuity audit, Mr. McDade presented the findings and recommendations arising from the audit. He stressed the importance to the college of a well-developed and functioning business continuity plan. Elisa Pacer also highlighted the importance of having a plan in place while pointing to the distinguishing features of the disaster recovery emergency preparedness, and business continuity plans, and the role they play in the optimal functioning of the institution. Quarterly projects update was given by Mr. McDade. He presented information on upcoming projects, which include an audit of the software management process, a review of the compliance environment, and a capital projects construction contract review. Mr. McDade also shared updates on the status of prior audit recommendations. Regarding the JCCC ethics line report update, there was a quarterly report between October 1st, 2018 and December 31st, 2018. Three reports were entered into the ethics line report system. Two reports were received anonymously, and as of January 31st, 2019, all complaints had been reviewed and appropriately addressed. In executive briefings, there was an audit follow-up matrix where Ms. 
Boyd, Rochelle Boyd shared updates on the status of prior audit recommendations. Our next meeting will be the audit committee meeting on Thursday, May the 2nd. And I might mention that the meeting was held this month in March because of the weather last month in February. The other thing I also wanted to share um, were the findings of the audit uh, report. There wasn't much uh, about that in this committee report, and so I wanted to add a little bit as well from that meeting. Um, we were looking at the audit report, and uh, the findings were absolutely wonderful. There was no problem with them. But Dr. Cook asked, what makes us good and great? And they cited the comparisons of business and other educational institutions and reassured us that in the world of technology, there will always be recommendations and areas for improvement. But we wanted to share with you that we show a knowledge of security and vendor management far ahead of most institutions. So I wanted to make sure that that was conveyed to everyone this evening. So Mr. McDade, I don't know if you would have anything that you wanted to add into addition to that. I would invite you up to the podium if you would. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Welcome. First, regarding the uh, cloud and hosted computing strategies audit, uh, again, uh, I'd like to echo what Trustee Cook said, and um, we do have a very active um, and professional IT team um, headed by Tom Pagano, our CIO, and he is working with us on a variety of facets. Uh, we do a couple of technology audits a year, typically, and that's a considerable um, amount of resources dedicated to that, and it, it's a credit to him and their department that they are, uh, they're always in compliance with that, they're always helpful, and um, we feel like they always take the time to make sure that, that any recommendations are addressed appropriately and quickly, and uh, it was good to see the results of this, this particular audit. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. Well, I appreciate that. I just wanted to take the opportunity to do that when I got the report. The report was great, Thank you. but I felt like it just didn't convey the strength of, of what we were doing here on campus, so I appreciate that very much. Okay. Anything you'd like to add, Tom? Okay. I would like to highlight in, in terms Absolutely. of the uh, business continuity audit, if I could, sure. um, that has been a significant um, amount of resources dedicated by our department, and we have taken a a wide approach to taking to surveying all the departments of the college to find out varying degrees of preparedness in case of uh, a major interruption of of service here and uh, what it would take to get these departments and their functions up and running and it's a, a, a project of considerable breadth and depth and so one of the things we've done is after we gathered the survey respondents we um, from throughout the college, um, we've been working closely again with information services to um, uh, get a consultant to come in, help us interpret those results, see where there's some gap analysis, and develop some business continuity plans at the departmental level um, throughout the college, and then to synthesize those into a college-wide business continuity plan, which is, um, is a fairly complex undertaking. Um, Luckily, again, um, Mr. Pagano has a wealth of experience both in this institution and in uh, the healthcare industry prior, and we are also fortunate that uh, Dr. Larson and Dr. Weber in their previous institutions um, have some experience with business continuity, and so we will be uh, looking forward to, to their contributions as well as that goes forth, and we also um, welcome any comments or, or questions in that regard. Thank you very much. All right, the next committee report is that of collegial steering, and I will go ahead and give that report as well. Um, collegial steering met on Tuesday, March the 4th. There were four items on the agenda this month. We began with a discussion of Banner 9, and conversation has continued since it was installed and work will continue on its customization. Everyone agreed it works well for students who know what, what class they want. There were a number of specific scheduling suggestions shared with discussion on legacy class search, special topics courses, wait lists for classes, and there being no PDF to see all history of class schedules. Tom Pagano joined us for the meeting and is very open to further discussion and is looking for ways to continue the conversations as needed. Teresa McChesney led a conversation about the impact of moving to a 15-week semester in the fall of 2020. 
Ed Affairs is working to get the message out to everyone that they need to get their courses through Ed Affairs prior to February of next year. Changes must be to the curriculum committee by October of this year. As a reminder to all, the beginning of August through February is always the busiest time for Ed Affairs, and she indicated further that this is an opportunity to reevaluate courses. Dr. McLeod discussed shared governance in respect to the HLC report and all that has been done to meet the requirements. Where are we in terms of this report? He stated that we have completed the first leg of the committees. The next step is that it has to be completed for every branch, vertical and lateral communication. In addition, we will look at how committee appointments are made and how to increase faculty engagement. That report is due back to the HLC in September. And I also wanted to mention there was a brief discussion held to see if members would be interested in changing the time of collegial steering to 3.30 instead of 4 o'clock. The earlier start would allow additional time with the intent of not abandoning discussion due to the 5 o'clock end time. Robust discussions have concluded due to the end time, and it would be our hope that some additional time would be beneficial. So we're waiting on confirmation that that will work out for Dr. Cook's schedule, and then we will send out something to the members of that committee. And that will just allow us the flexibility to add a little bit of time if we'd like to go a little bit past 4.30. So that concludes my report. <laughs> and I needed to thank myself. <laughs> All right. Uh, the next step is Trustee Lawson and Human Resources. Thank you, Madam You're Chair. Uh, the Human Resource Committee met at 8 a.m. on Friday, March 1st, 2019 in the Lytle Conference Room right next door to us. Uh, Mr. Tom Bagano, uh, Vice President of Information Services, CIO, presented information on client support services. The areas of coverage that included information of technology management, multimedia services, technical support center, which is the help desk, uh, and computer lab supervision. He also reported that since 2015, the Technical Support Center has employed student workers beginning with the three students, and at present there are now 14 student employees. Thank you. Um, Ms. Becky Centerloaf, thank you. Uh, Ms. Uh, Vice President of Human Resources and Mr. Jerry Zimmerman, Management of Benefits, presented information and recommendation um, that we will be going forward, and there is a change in the board packet. You see that there's three recommendations. One of the recommendations uh, was given to me just a few this afternoon as a new recommendation based on some current information that came forward. So I believe that there is a presentation uh, that Becky and uh, Dr. Larson will be doing to give us up to date on those. Um, these, so in the board packet on page two, that is going to be the recommendation that is going to be, uh, I'm going to bring a motion forward. So as at this moment, it's not the opinion of the Human Resource Committee, but it's the opinion of the administration. And I'd like to be able to give an opportunity to present the new data. Okay, and one of the things we're going to do is we're just going to go over, we've talked to a number of uh, trustees, but we wanted just to have this in the open meeting is just the reasoning for bringing these benefits forward. So we're just going to go over this. It might be new to some people. Uh, some of you might have heard it before. So there's three recommendations we're bringing forward, and actually they're bringing it forward for three different groups. The first one is our tuition reduction and in-county tuition benefit. This benefit is for part-time temporary new student employees. This is a new student employee classification that we've never had before. Um, the criteria is they have to be a JCC student, they can work up to 25 hours a week, and the positions that will be awarded this benefit are the student ambassadors, student peer tutors, student support technicians, student sustainability interns, student recording arts support assistants. And as of right now, there's a total of 84 uh, people in these positions. The benefits is we know that engaged students are more successful. By providing work experience for these students, it also provides us an opportunity to see how they work and provide um, recruiting opportunities for us. A strategy under our student success priority of the strategic plan is to provide campus engagement opportunities to strengthen students' college experience. This benefit will support that strategy. And this is the recommendation. 
The second is holiday pay and prorated paid annual leave. And this is for part-time regular employees. There are currently 372 part-time regular employees that will be eligible for these benefits. Some of these positions include admin assistants, office assistants, accounting specialists, police dispatchers, child care aides and lead teachers, computer lab assistants, counselors, custodians, dining service assistants, financial aid assistants, librarians, maintenance aides, museum guards, success advocates, testing center assistants, our wellness coordinator, registered dietitian, and senior legal counsel. Some of the reasons that we're proposing these benefits, these enhanced benefits, is really one is to recruit and compete with part-time talent. We are competing with other academic institutions, K through 12, MCC, KC, KCC, Baker University, along with retail organizations like Costco, UPS, Starbucks, Barnes & Noble, REI, and so on. An example of why this creates financial stress for these individuals is currently these people get no holiday pay, and over the winter holiday break, many of them, if this is their primary employment, get no check. They miss a check over the holiday break. Our turnover in this group is about two to three times that of our full-time employees. We would kind of expect that, but as we were looking at benchmarking against the others, other organizations in the Kansas City area, what we found is when we look at turnover, we look at turnover as somebody leaving the college. And most organizations look at turnover as leaving the position. But many of our part-time people end up going into full-time positions here at the college, so we don't even count those, but it's still two to three times higher than our full-time. We have some inequity issues over a holiday break. You would have a full-time person. Some, some positions have to work over the holiday breaks, and on those positions, you would have a full-time and a part-time person working side by side. The full-time person would be making double time and a half because they're working the holiday, and the part-time person would be getting straight time. So a strategy under the employment engagement priority of the strategic plan is to attract and retain high caliber people. This benefit would support that strategy. Here is some comparative data that we were able to pull on organizations that paid holiday and PAL. And I will just note, UMKC, when we did talk to them, they don't pay paid holidays or PAL, but at 30 hours a week, they consider them full-time and they get full benefits. We originally, we have a revised recommendation on this. Uh, we originally discovered, or originally we're going to prorate the holiday pay. We discovered regularly assigned hours fluctuate so considerably over the course of the year that depending upon where the holidays fail, it could change the employee's holiday pay. Um, after HR and finance worked together through the logistics of it, we determined that it would be clearer for all to be consistent <coughs> in how we award holiday pay, and we came up with the four hours of pay per holiday. And that's a recommendation we would like to bring forward. The final benefit that we're looking at is the Voluntary Employment Retirement Benefit. We, we changed the name on this periodically, but we decided we'd land on the verb. Uh, this is for full-time regular employees. The criteria for the Voluntary Employee Retirement Program is 10 years or more of full-time service with the college. They must retire under the provisions of CAPERS, and the sick leave payout is graduated based on years of, of service to the college. Some of the justification for offering this benefit include payout of accrued and unused sick leave rewards an employee who did, did not use a lot of sick leave during their career here. <coughs> Salary savings through the reduced payroll and benefit cost is eligible staff usually are higher on the pay scale. And some of the savings realized through our previous retirement incentive plan is eligible employees were at the higher end of the pay scale. They were replaced with people at or below the midpoint. There were reduced benefit costs moving 
employees from group one to group two, and it allowed the college to reallocate those positions to other areas if needed. Some of these positions remain vacant now. The proposed voluntary employee retirement benefit provides position openings and promotional opportunities and for succession planning and retention of mid-career employees. It also allows the college to reallocate staffing to better serve the changing needs of students and provides work-life balance solutions to employees who in the absence of health benefits are required to work past their eligible retirement age. Two of the strategies under our employee engagement priority of the strategic plan is to attract and retain high caliber people and provide professional and personal development opportunities for individuals. This benefit will support those strategies. Here is some comparative data on retirement plans and we looked at state, the state of Kansas, other local and national community colleges, KBOR schools, and local K through 12 schools. And what we're proposing is probably about the middle of the road for all of those that we had listed. And this is our recommendation. And I'm going to turn the rest over to Barbara. Thank you, Becky. Because this is a fairly sizable investment, uh, especially in the uh, VERB program, the Voluntary Retirement Benefit, the college would budget uh, in the FY20 years, so the budget coming up, $5.8 million, which is based on the eligible group of individuals this year. It is required under GASB that we book this entire amount, even though we know that as we roll this out, not all eligible employees would take this program. We had similar programs a few years ago and had participation rates, I believe, of less than 30%. Um, in the following years, after we book that initial use of reserves, we estimate, and again, we don't know, but we estimate three hundred to $400,000 a year. At the HR committee, um, we were asked about the impact of this of this budgeting on those financial ratios that the board sees, the management committee sees every year, and those two financial ratios that would be affected by the use of net reserves in moving forward with this would be the viability ratio and the composite financial indicator, indicator ratio. And we'll, I'll show you those graphs, but both ratios using the $5.8 million in FY20 remain within the ideal ranges. This is a one-time use of reserve, so it is not ongoing. The ongoing cost is that estimate of three hundred dollars to $400,000. So the analysis that Rachel Lears and, uh, and her staff performed still assumes that we have the final payment towards the facilities master plan. You'll recall that we had several years of use of general fund reserves toward the facilities master plan. So this is now adding that $5.8 million um, reserve to it. So the viability ratio, you see it dropping, staying within the ideal range. And again, most of that drop from uh, the 4.78 was when the board proceeded, when we proceeded with borrowing $50 million toward the facilities master plan. So you see that drop, you see some recovery because we did not take on more debt uh, in FY19, but then a slight drop both using the final $15 million toward the facilities master plan and that $5.8 million. So we would expect without further, um, without further borrowing and none is immediately planned, that that would continue to move up slightly. And the viability ratio has to do with our long-term debt. It's the expendable net assets over our long-term debt. The composite financial indicator is an indicator that combines uh, four other ratios that we look at on an annual basis. So again, the viability ratio is part of this. And you see this dropping again by adding both the facilities master plan obligation as well as this $5.8 million. But again, we would expect that to um, be at the bottom there in 2020 and start to recover. Can, can I interrupt? Sure. Uh, can we go back to the previous slide? Sure. I tried real hard, but I don't understand it. 
What are we looking at, sorry? We are looking at a graph that represents um, expendable net assets, that is total reserves, over long-term debt. And so when the, when the college borrowed $50 million toward the facilities master plan, you saw that drop from the 4.78, the high, um, to the 2.01. So in other words, do we have enough liquid assets on hand to cover yes. the debt that we're okay. yes. Sorry. yes, that's exactly right. In addition, uh, financial services staff looked at the five-year financial projection that we look at as part of our budget development. Um, and so we are now incorporating this $5.8 million into that five-year projection, in addition to the $15 million in FY20 for the facilities master plan. We assumed a 4% increase in assessed valuation and then 3% annually thereafter. This model assumes about $6 million annually beginning in FY 2021 for science lab renovations. So we've already incorporated those future plans into this model. And we assume that we are going to spend 93% of the general fund budget going forward. So again, I know that this is difficult to see, um, but the board recently modified our policy with regard to reserves maintaining those reserves at 25% or above at the lowest point in the fiscal year, which is December, uh, December 31st. And in this model, they stay at about 28% to 29, 33, and so um, continue upward. Now, um, finally, I know that this is just one potential scenario for the future. Um, we, could, we could talk about that assessed valuation uh, scenario of 4%, 3 and 3. We all know that we've had years where assessed valuation actually dropped year over year. This doesn't assume anything about the dark stores theory being implemented, but um, at least this is a scenario um, that we think is, is probably middle of the road um, and does maintain our reserves where they need to be. Questions? Um, yes. Barbara, can you go back to the to the two graphs, the one that Trustee yes. Cross asked about? Yes. <clears throat> if in either of those two graphs um, the the line goes above the green, what would what what is the impact of that? It's if in other words, if we weren't taking this action and the and the graph went above into say six six point five. It, it would just indicate that we have almost no debt. It would Right. And, and, and what would happen in that? Would, would make an, an investment in something, correct? Correct. Yeah. Right. It would okay. be an opportunity, but yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I just, can we go back to the recommendation that's the new one that we need to make a motion on to accept because it's different than the one that's in the board packet? Sure. That one right there. So I just, uh, I move to make a motion to accept the revised recommendation. Uh, and I just need a second. Second. We do have a motion and a second. Do I hear any other discussion? Anyone? Steve? No. No? Okay, we do have a motion and a second, so we'll go ahead and vote if you're ready to do that then. Uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. <laughs> Okay, motion carried. Uh, so just acknowledging that when the new board packet online we'll have the revised recommendation. <coughs> Thank you. So moving forward, uh, would like to bring forward these three recommendations that were discussed. Um, and I think you did a great job. Thank you so much for the presentation on both. And then we can open it up for further discussion into these specific policies. Uh, I move to make a re recommendation. Sorry, I'm looking at my, there it is. It is the recommendation of the college administration that the Board of Trustees authorized effectively July 1st, 2019, the holiday pay equivalent to four hours of pay per holiday and paid annual leave, that's the PAL, uh, prorated based on years of service for all part-time regular hour, hourly and salary, salaried employees. I'll second so that. Move, I thought, make a motion. I thought that's what we just did. That. Well, I mean, but now we're doing like the actual. Okay, second in the board packet it had the old you're just doing them individually right correct okay yes unless we want to do them as a whole no i, I just figured so. it's better to do them separate. Separate. gives me more times to be a contrarian <laughs> <laughs> so we have a motion and a second okay is there any discussion 
there no no discussion? Okay, there being no further discussion, we'll go ahead and vote. Signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed, same sign. Okay. Uh, second recommendation. Um, it's the recommendation of the college administration and the board of trustees to authorize effectively July 1st, 2019, uh, the tuition reduction of three credit hours each semester and in county tuition rate on all credit hours for employees in the newly designated part-time temporary student employee classification. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Once again, is there any discussion? I have a question on that because I, Becky, I thought at the committee meeting, you, you listed $42,000 as the annual Correct. cost of that by, by foregoing tuition. I thought it was like $16,000. <coughs> we were looking at 14000 per semester. And that we looked at our current group, the, the current group of yeah. people in those positions now. And it's what it is, it's, it's granting a three credit hour reduction. And then if they are out of county, they get in county. So the total bigger than it was at the committee three, meeting, but same. All three, there, you're including three summer, yeah, summer, summer, spring, but, fall. And so, okay, right. Right. I knew the number was different. <clears throat> Isn't it worth pointing out there that that's a current benefit to part-time regular right. employees of which each of these students <laughs> already exist. So that's not a new 42,000. Those, those, those classifications that students currently work already have that benefit, but in creating this new class, it's creating the benefit for that class as well. So if, if we were not to change their class, they would still be afforded these same benefits. Does that make sense? So, so that those positions today have this benefit, but we're creating a new student classification, and this is the benefit that would be created for them. So that's the cost of the benefit, but that cost is already expensed today because they received the benefit in their current part-time regular position. And that's going to be position. probably 80% of those positions. There are a few yeah. positions that are currently temporary that would be so it's just moving the bookkeeping is effectively what we're already paying that we're creating a new classification for this group of folks and we're just moving that into a line that matches all right I, I don't think that's consistent with what I understood from the HR committee meeting that we there were some classes of students with employment that did get tuition reductions and there were other students that did not and we were moving the ones that did not to, to equalize that there, there was there are students that actually work in regular <coughs> jobs. They don't have to be a student to work in those jobs. Right. So those, and those get the tuition reduction and they get the in-county tuition. Then there are others that truly, like the student ambassadors is a perfect example. They have to be a student. They do get that credit. But the, um, the positions that- The recording are, arts special. The recording like arts, yeah. Uh, peer tutors, right now, they do not get the tuition reduction. So there's a number of those, but the majority, I'd say 80% of them, actually get that benefit right now. But there is a few of them that won't. Well, I just, that wasn't clear at the committee meeting, and I'm not sure it's clear to me now. There are, the $42,000 in cost, is that the total cost of all student, part-time students that will get the benefit? Yes. And some of that was already being booked 80%-ish? And so the new cost is 20% of that? And students that are now getting the benefit that didn't get it before? We took a snapshot of all of the people that were currently in those positions right now. And we said, okay, what if we were to basically move them all into this category? How much more is that going to cost? And it was going to cost the 42 annually or 14000 a semester. Okay. Well, I, I, support, I, I support the goal of having these students get a tuition reduction at a break uh, um, it hasn't been clear to me it was clear to me at the committee meeting it's not clear to me tonight but I'll, I'll go ahead and support the motion because the concept is what we want to do um, if we show it as a $42,000 cost I assume that's a new cost unless you tell me that 42,000 is already on the books and only 10,000 of that is a new cost I think our job up here on the, as a fiduciary is to know what additional <coughs> costs we're adding to the budget that have to be picked up by the general fund. Um, so I, I support the concept, and we can work out the accounting later so that I understand it. Well, but thank you for asking, because sometimes mm -hmm. I just don't understand accounting. It's not their accounting, it's not your accounting, I just don't understand <laughs> Are you okay to move on? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so we're okay so yeah. to go ahead. Okay, we do have a motion and a second. Are there any further questions regarding that? Okay. 
Those in favor, may say aye. 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 Those, same sign. Motion carries. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. The Thank final you um, oh. recommendation. <laughs> It is a recommendation of the college administration uh, that the Board of Trustees authorize if effectively July 1st, 2019, a voluntary retirement benefits to all full-time employees based on the years of service with JCCC and occurred and occurred an unused sick leave balance on their retirement date. Second, second. Okay. Motion and second once again. Any further discussion? Discussion on this. Well, I'm, I'm going to, I just want to think about talk about this. This is a $5.8 million commitment of reserves, which is something that we, we don't do every day. And we spend a lot of time up here sometimes fussing over relatively small amounts or, or, or other issues that draw attention. But um, I, I will support this because I'm, I've been convinced by administration and staff and faculty that have talked to me that this is an important part of our, the strategic goal that Becky went over of attracting and retaining the highest quality, uh, both staff and faculty that we want, which has always been my test when it comes to employee benefits. Um, my concerns I raised it and questions I raised that have been, have been answered uh, between the committee meeting and today involved uh, looking at comparative places. I think I might say that we're a little bit better than the middle, looking at our peer institutions and the Board of Regents uh, institutions. Uh, as far as this being a, a, a little better benefit than average, probably. Um, I, I had concerns about where, what this did to our financial ratios, and I appreciate your uh, providing that. I had concerns about what it did to our five-year projection, and we just raised the minimum for the policy goal for reserves to 25% from 10%, and I wanted to make sure we weren't going to uh, impact that. Um, this will reduce our flexibility because it means that there's 5.8 million of reserves that we can't use for some project, whether it's science labs or some other need that we have. Uh, I think we have very well managed our reserves. We grew them so we could spend them on the facilities master plan. Um, and this is another worthwhile place to expend that money. Uh, with respect to any employee benefit, I think it's incumbent upon us to all recognize once it is in place, it would be very difficult to ever modify it. And so our flexibility within the general fund budget um, and using our reserves will be affected by this. But all in all, I believe it's a it's a, the right thing to do uh, for the employees at the college. So I will support the motion. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I also will be supporting this as a, um, as a former employer that experienced over 200% uh, turnover per year in, in my former business. I, I applaud the, the, the college for making an investment in the people who work here, so I will be supporting it. Mm -hmm. I, I do challenge staff to come up with another adjective uh, for adjective since this is called verb. <laughs> We're a college, surely. <laughs> we a program. Challenge accepted. <laughs> 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 We <laughs> won't be spending the 5.8 million guaranteed. The 5.8 million is only available. It's committed, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Committed. Committed, committed but not committed. necessarily spent. Correct. Okay. okay. So but it's, it's not available for anything else. Right. We have to keep that segregated. Right. That's what reduces our flexibility. It's encumbered. And then 300 to 400,000 a year. Right. right. Well, right. while we're on it, if I may, and I think I asked the other day, do we know how many people are going to? Do we have any idea who's going to avail themselves of this? We don't. We have 281 people that are eligible to take it. Um, when we offered the other retirement incentive, it was um, a little more generous in what it was paying out. And so we don't anticipate that we, and at that time we had about 30% that took it, a little bit less. So we don't anticipate, we anticipate probably less than 30%. Thank you. The other thing that maybe Becky or Dr. Larson can speak to is there is discretion within that that if all five people in one department decided to take it, the administration can determine that they aren't, eligible, aren't all eligible the same year. They can be eligible the next year and actually get a benefit of 10% additional paid annual leave. So we're not in the situation where an entire department that happens to be eligible uh, would, would go away without some 
uh, control uh, by the administration to make sure the college continues to function. Uh, yeah, so I was going to speak about the ratchets in place so that there's not a, a flight to uh, leave, but there's a, a mechanism in place that allows um, the work to continue in departments and make sure that that's going right. Uh, but I also really commend the opportunity to invest back and just give gratitude for the professors and the staff that have been here and dedicated a long standing time uh, to be able to give them this opportunity because a lot of People here at the college, either professors or staff, have given um, publications, patents to us. I mean, there's quite a lot of assets that, as a college, we have occurred from their work and their life's work. Um, but also that, I mean, my belief system is that benefits are not a gift. It's something that's earned. So they have earned their right for this benefit. Um, just like when we see pensions are just delayed payments. You know, these are things that people have earned for that, so I appreciate um, this recommendation to come forward. Thank you. Did you have anything? Okay. All right. Uh, we have the motion and a second to approve the voluntary retirement benefit for full-time employees. If there's no further discussion, we'll go ahead and take that vote. So signify your support by saying aye. 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 Yes. Any opposed? Same sign. Okay. Motion passed. Thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes my report for human resources. I just wanted to thank the trustees for approving these recommendations, especially the last one. Um, words that were said about the reserve and the status of the reserve reflects an incredible team effort across campus as everyone's worked very hard to get that reserve to where it needs to be. And it also reflects the vision of the trustees who approved a 0.75 increase in the mill, which was a significant uh, factor in growing this reserve the where it is, is today. So I want to thank you very much. I think it's a very appropriate use of a reserve. So thank you. Wasn't that your recommendation? 0.75? Um, yes, I think it was. <laughs> but I'm not sure. Well done. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the next committee report is that of Learning Quality, <laughs> Trustee Snyder. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the Learning Quality Committee met on March 4th. We have no recommendations, but do want to just highlight uh, some of the items that we covered in, in that uh, robust meeting. Uh, first, we heard about a sabbatical presentation about uh, the library, including those attitudes of people that don't use the library, how they feel about the library. It was interesting. Uh, <laughs> Sheila Maupin and her team talked about some of their initiatives around career and tech ed, particularly some of the early college options available to, to students. Uh, Jim Lane and Paul Kyle presented about uh, a team that they had put together that's, that's been in place for some time, but, but looking at enrollment goals uh, for the college. And so um, uh, if you didn't uh, thoroughly review the packet when it came out uh, for those committees. You might take a look at those because it kind of dictates where we might head with enrollment. Uh, and then finally, the grants team gave an overview of all the, the fine work that they do, and it's always interesting and uh, encouraging to see all the, the grants that, that come into the college and help us run and do great things. So uh, with that, uh, I will close. Thank you. Okay. Madam Chair, I yes. just had one, uh, two items that I did not get a chance to review in the Human Resource Committee. Do I have a second just to review those? Sure. It was on um, Ms. Tanya Wilson, uh, General Counsel, mentioned the proposed amendments addressing the gender identity to the discrimination and harassment and retaliation policy and the non-discrimination policy will go into the Policy Procedure Committee in March and anticipate it going to the HR Committee for recommendation in April. Uh, and then at that time, if that goes through, it will come to the board in April. And then the next Human Resource Committee meeting is scheduled for Friday, April 5th, 2019 at 8 a.m. in the Lido Conference Room next door. Thank you. I apologize. If no, no, you're fine. Quickly. You're fine. Okay. All right. Uh, the next order of business is the management report, which I will also be giving. Um, management committee met at 8 a.m. on Wednesday, March the 6th. The information related to the management meeting begins on page 10 and runs through page 17 of the board packet. The management committee reviewed several presentations from staff. Barbara Larson, Executive Vice President, Finance and Administrative Services, presented information on an agreement with the Archdiocese of Kansas City in Kansas for College Now classes. Additional items were a facility use agreement and equipment use agreement with the American Central Transport for CDL training. This information can be found in the consent agenda on pages 37 and 38 of the board packet. 
Rachel Lears, Associate Vice President of Financial Services, CFO, provided information about the 2019-2020 budget development. More information on the budget will be forthcoming at the April management meeting in advance of the annual budget workshop held at the start of the April board meeting. On Thursday, March 7th, college staff members attended a meeting hosted by Paul Welcome, Johnson County appraiser, who provided information on property reevaluations for 2019. Information from this meeting will be used to update the college's ad valorem property tax revenue budget figures for the 2019-2020 physical year. Janelle Vogler, Associate Vice President for Business Services, provided a very informative presentation on auxiliary services. She introduced Ashanti Thompson, Bookstore Manager, and Jay Glatz, Director of Dining Services. They provided an overview of expense and revenue activities from the past few years and how they contribute to the fund. The presentation also included a discussion on upcoming changes to the bookstore and dining services with the new renovated spaces in the student center, as well as on the first floor of the library. Ms. Vogler also presented the single source purchase report. Rex Hayes, Associate Vice President, Campus Services and Facility Planning, gave a monthly progress report on capital infrastructure projects, and this report is on page 14 of the packet. Next, he gave an update on the construction projects across campus. He reviewed the report on the financial status of the facility's master plan, and that report is in your packet on page 15. The management committee has two recommendations to present this evening. There was one recommendation based on a bid, and this was for the Carlson Center parking garage recoding and repair. And I will go ahead with that recommendation. It is the recommendation of the management committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the college administration to approve the low bid from John Royer Contracting in the amount of $212,000 with an additional 10% contingency of $21,200 to allow for possible unforeseen costs for a total expenditure not to exceed $233,200, and I will make that motion. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Is there any? Oh, he left. <laughs> I missed it. Um, any questions regarding that motion? Yes. Just, just a comment. That was the low bid, too. Yes, it yes. was the low bid. Thank you for bringing that up. You bet. Okay, we do have a motion and a second um, to go ahead and accept that expenditure. Um, there being no further discussion, we'll go ahead. If you are in agreement with that, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign, motion carries. The second recommendation, um, our final recommendation, is to grant property right of way and easements to Water District Number 1 of Johnson County. This is related to the renovations associated with the outdoor athletics and <coughs> campus gateway projects on campus. It is the recommendation of the Management Committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to approve the grant and conveyance of the above specified perpetual right of way and easements to Water District Number 1, Johnson County, associated with the renovations related to outdoor athletics and campus gateway projects, and that the Board authorize the President to execute the necessary documentation to grant and convey such right of way and easements, and to take such other necessary action and appropriate to effectuate the same, and I will make that motion. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion about that? There being none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you all very much. Okay, the next order of business is President. Madam, Madam Chair, yes. I'm, I can't resist my curiosity. You met on March 6th, and on March 7th, staff met with the county appraiser. Yes. Um, so we had anticipated a 4% increase in appraised value. What did the appraiser tell us? was the actual? The actual appraised increase, I believe, and I have to, I think it was 6.76, is that correct, Rachel? Um, now, understand, Trustee Musil, that then we look at our historic collections and we then roll that back based on delinquencies, appeals, uh, exempt property, and so we're recommending that we use 5.75 for the budget process in terms of the assessed valuation increase. So what's that? Well, we'll have a budget workshop next month, and you will present a budget 
based on what our budget guidelines of four percent increase or a an actual increase of five point seven five percent at this point it would be based on an actual increase of five point seven five percent I would appreciate knowing before that meeting or having included in that meeting what it would be if we used four percent and what our mill levy rollback would be to once again as we did last year take the amount of money we said we needed in January when we set our budget guidelines if if the administration could provide that I'd appreciate it Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. So the Treasurer's Report, Mr. Musil. Treasurer's Report uh, included in the board packet for the month end of January 31, 2019. Items of note include uh, that page one of the Treasurer's Report is our general post-secondary technical education fund summary, the largest fund we have. January was the seventh month of the college's 2018-2019 fiscal year. Um, in January, we received an ad valorem tax distribution, which is property tax revenues of about $55 million from the county treasurer. Um, it was distributed primarily to the general fund, some to the special assessment fund, and some to our capital outlay fund that is used for capital projects. I look back, our budget for property tax revenues for this fiscal year is just short of $100 million, so we received 50, almost $55 million of that in January. Um, also during January, the state operating grant payments, which is the monies we get from the state of Kansas, of about $10.6 million was received and were recorded into the general fund and the post-secondary technical education fund. A total of uh, $10.6 million was received. The college's unencumbered cash balance as of January 31, 2019 was $120.6 million, approximately a $1 million higher than last year, and all of the expenditures in the Operating, primary operating funds are within the approved budgetary limits as set by this board. So based on that, it's the recommendation of the college administration that the Board of Trustees approve the Treasurer's Report for the month end of January 31, 2019, subject to audit, and I so move. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the Treasurer's Report. Is there any discussion regarding that? There being none, we'll go ahead and vote. All in favor of accepting the treasurer's report, say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. I'm not aware of any, oh, excuse me, the president's report, <laughs> monthly report to the board. Thank you, Chair Ingram. I'm moving quickly. I thought I was going to get preempted there. No, um, got to watch it. First of all, please, please take the time to read the monthly report goes out. You can just look at that front page and you can see the Quindaro. These are some events that happen on campus, the Quindaro Preservation, KC Biz Fest, Science Olympiad. Um, just another example of how our colleges engage in the community. I'll be addressing that uh, later in the report. But first, um, the much anticipated lightning round. And I'm going to ask Dr. Weber to, to kick it off. Oh, thank you very much for the opportunity to share on us something. Um, what I'd like to recognize tonight is we have uh, just last month you, you approved some policy changes. Uh, as a result of what we're calling our removing barriers work. It'll be ongoing work we do. Um, but the kickoff project for this was really looking at policies and procedures that we have in place that might be inconsistent with our, our commitment to increase student enrollment and more importantly, their completion. Um, and and what, we, what we approved last month was, the, was some policies and procedures around academic standing um, the way we require transcripts uh, from previous and prior institutions uh, upon enrollment at JCCC, as well as how we transfer grades in. Uh, the thing I'm proud of about the work that, that, that this group has done and, and the changes we made was what it did is it took our, our students who come to JCCC and put greater emphasis on their experience here than maybe their past uh, experiences at other institutions. In any given semester, we might put uh, nearly 400 holds on uh, student accounts for not providing us their prior institution's transcripts. So we wouldn't let them enroll for a second semester if we didn't get those transcripts, regardless of if they got a 4.0 in their first semester here or for whatever reason. So there were some, some, some situations like that that really didn't benefit our commitment to student. Um, student enrollment and student completion. So it was great work, uh, the great team that was charged to do this. Dr. McLeod and I, um, I identified a team after my team did some initial assessment to realize the policies that would uh, need to be reflected on this. And it was uh, selected from members of our Ed Affairs team as well as my team. And I'd like to just really quickly name off those who did it because 
Um, in addition to the meaningful work, I was really proud that it was a, it was a collaborative effort from cross departments uh, uh, among the college. And so I, I want to thank this group. It, it includes Teresa McChesney, Lori Shank, and Mazza Nakam, uh, each professors, Melanie Roberts from our counseling team, uh, Gurbashan Singh, uh, 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 AVP and in instruction, and then from my team, Crystal Williams and financial aid. Leslie Quinn, Pete Belk, and Margie Shelley from Enrollment Services. And it was tremendous work they did. Love seeing them all work together. And, and our students in the future will truly benefit from these changes. Thank you, Randy. Karen? Yes, I, I'm going to um, also talk a little bit about collaboration as well, too. Um, for something that just happened today on campus, you've heard a lot as we're going into the career and technical education together with credit, and we work a lot with student services on collaborations, which in the past, you know, we might have been with um, dealing with workforce needs, talking from two different perspectives. So a great example of that today is um, Debbie Rulo, uh, who I think is in it here tonight as well too, from our continuing education department. She's our director of our uh, strategic partnerships and on our business development uh, side of the house worked with the student services team to bring in 14 students from TLC to tour campus and hear about uh, credit opportunities for them as well as continuing education uh, <coughs> opportunities for them. With, again, like Janice said, us all coming together to get them those credentials or services that they need so they can uh, go into the workforce. With a low unemployment rate, we need to be doing what we can to help um, um, possibly underserved students do those types of things. So majority of these students were uh, in the foster care system, and we had great help today from um, 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 Melissa uh, Jimenez in a recruitment coordinator who talked to them about all the credit certificates and associates. Debbie talked about the credentials they could receive in continuing ed. Ivory Smith talked to them about financial aid through either the foundation, but also how to access funding they may have that they just need someone to assist them in working through those systems. And then we had student ambassadors who um, took the ones that were interested in career and technical education on tours of our career and technical education facilities. So um, they were very interested. M most of them had not been on campus before and uh, just great questions and enthusiasm. So I appreciate the collaborations and the opportunities we've had to work together to serve those workforce needs. That's great. Thank you, Karen. Nikki? Well, uh, in keeping with what we've done kind of as a college as a whole, but also in keeping with the, today being the beginning of March Madness, I'd like to talk a little <laughs> bit about uh, uh, two, two things in particular. The first being uh, our, our different uh, kind of academic March Madness. Um, today marks the first day of the National Debate Tournament, and for the first time in the 50 years of this august institution, Johnson County qualified a team uh, that is seated and will be competing in the national debate tournament against Harvard, Rutgers, um, UCLA, Yale. Uh, we are one of five community colleges in the history of the national debate tournament over 73 years to ever qualify. And this is the first time that our faculty has been able to produce a great team of students that got us qualified. And I expect to find out that we have uh, we've won a few rounds and scared a few folks. <laughs> So that, that's going to be a great thing for us to look forward to, getting those results back. Uh, that begins today at the University of Minnesota. And so we're really excited about that. Uh, and then on the home front, <laughs> and on the home front, we had a little bit of a victory yesterday at Kabor. I know you don't usually hear that. Uh, but uh, over the last seven months or so, I've been working closely um, with some colleagues at the University of Kansas. Uh, to rectify something that I discovered when I moved here and thought was a little bit of an injustice. Um, in dealing with uh, degree transfer in the early 2000s, uh, there was a KBOR mandate put in place that a student who transferred from a community college was required to do 60 hours um, of work at the baccalaureate level there, regardless of what courses they had already brought with them. It was a bit unfair because you could transfer from a baccalaureate granting institution and only do 30. Um, and so we proposed a policy change several months ago, which finally made its way up to the board yesterday. Um, and so as of yesterday, about 4 p.m. when it was passed, Johnson County Community College will begin a relationship uh, with the University of Kansas that will begin to unmake that. And we will be able to uh, forward our students on with only a, 
a ceiling of 45 hours required for baccalaureate at that level, so they can take more of their courses at the community college level. Um, several of the universities uh, pushed back a little bit against us on this and asked for it to be um, sunset within three years of it beginning um, to, to treat it as a pilot um, in their wisdom. The board struck down the sunset provision uh, yesterday during the vote, and so we now have um, an unfettered opportunity to really increase transfer opportunities for our students, increase completion of our students at this level, and allow them to take with them all the things that we offer at Johnson County. The next goal is to try and make this um, something that will benefit the entire state by bringing it um, to fruition for all community colleges. We'll be reporting each year about how we have adjusted uh, our transfer and how we've adjusted programs to meet this. Um, so that the board can start to move forward on making this change for the entire state. Thank you. I know there's a lot of heavy lifting in that. And Randy, I know you were involved in some of the early discussions as well. Uh, what was the, the vote with the Board of Regents? It was unanimous. Wow. I was terrific. kind of surprised myself. That is terrific. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for all that, all that, that hard work. No small feat, I can tell you. Um, I'm going to talk a little, bit, a little bit about our role as a convener in this county. One of the things we do here at Johnson County Community College, we bring people together. Um, we have a lot of events. Many, many of you around this table have attended those events on our campus. Um, sometimes um, they just come out of the blue, and everyone responds, and they get the job done every time, and they do a wonderful, wonderful, um, uh, do a wonderful effort. It comes together. I'd like to share with you just a couple of these events that have occurred over the last couple of weeks, and also some that will be in our near future. On March 9th, we hosted a tribute to Martin Luther King. This was rescheduled from Martin Luther King Day when the campus was closed due to weather. The tribute, the performance on stage was fantastic. I want to recognize Vivian Avery, who always leads this effort, Dr. Cynthia Johnson, who is the uh, writer, director, and one of the star performers. Um, also, there was an incredible cast that performed as well. We hosted this event last year, we hosted it this year, and we look forward to hosting this one in the future. On March 20th, which was yesterday, we hosted the United States District Court for the District of Kansas Naturalization Proceedings. Many of you have attended this, the ceremony. The Honorable Teresa J. James presided over the ceremony that welcomed 425 individuals from around the world as citizens of the United States. It is always an inspirational, an, an inspirational ceremony. Special thanks go to Anita Tebby, a faculty legend for her role of leading our paralegal program. She arranges the logistics for this event. The event was even more special this year as our own M. Smale, who manages the food court, became a citizen. I had the honor to deliver the keynote address. We will be hosting this ceremony again on Wednesday, May 29th. This Saturday, March 23rd at 10 a.m., we will host a town hall discussion featuring Kansas Governor Laura Kelly. This event will be in the Polsky Theater. I know there's a legislative breakfast that morning. For many, they can come straight from the breakfast and come up here for the town hall. We expect an informative and lively discussion. On Friday, April 26th, we'll host the official ribbon cutting of the Fine Arts and Design Studio. The guest list is lengthy and an outstanding celebration is planned. In every case, when we have such an event, it requires the efforts of the entire campus, our police department, food services, the Carlson Center team, backstage and front of stage, ball stars, scheduling, housekeeping, custodial, marketing and public relations, information systems, and I know I probably left someone out and I, and I, and I apologize. So many people come together to pull off a perfect experience for everyone who attends such an event, and believe me, they are appreciated. I would like to thank everyone on this campus who helped make these special events happen, and they do so in such an amazing fashion. Thank you all for making Johnson County, the Johnson County Community College the convener in our county. Thank you. That concludes our report. Okay. Thank you. Any questions for Dr. Subject? I am not aware of any old business or new business, so we'll move ahead to the reports from the board liaisons, and we'll begin with faculty association. Dr. Harvey. Good evening. Well, 
I'm on spring break right now. <laughs> um, and so the campus is quiet, right? Because our students are gone, our nine month people are gone. So it's nice and quiet around here. Um, this seems like the good news board meeting. Um, I, I wanna just say, uh, well, I just went to Austin for a few days, so I ate tons of tacos of all kinds. I had a great time visiting a good friend of mine there. And um, my sister's in town when I get back home, so, so like I said, spring break. Um, I do wanna give a shout out to Daniel Stout um, with the debate team. That was uh, Dr. McLeod, what Dr. McLeod shared when he was hired here. And I believe he was in my, uh, my lens group. I remember being a new faculty member at the same time as him. And when he was hired here, he said he wanted to make a national debate tournament. He's like, I'm gonna do that. And um, some people didn't think he, didn't take him seriously at that, but um, now they've delivered this year. So we're super, super proud of them and their hard work. Um, I also just want to share of how thrilled I am about KBOR's decision to allow our students to fully complete a program here and then transfer to KU. That's, that's just a gigantic win for us and for our students, really, who can now, you know, take the whole package of all the things they're supposed to take. And, you know, there's so many reasons they come here and that they're not starting off at KU or somewhere else, and just to allow them to do a full two years here and then transfer is, um, it really is the right thing to do. So I'm so glad that that is gonna be in place. Is that, does that start? Um, we will be able to start with the coming fall. academic year. We're gonna great. start working on it now. Perfect, that's great. Um, next week we have our faculty association meeting on Thursday. So I don't have a lot of new information except that um, I'll say one of the things we're going to finally, I think, have time to talk about is our, our budget for next year. And um, one of the things that we've discussed is sort of ways that we can partner with the foundation. And I think uh, many of our members are interested in maybe, you know, we have tr traditionally uh, partnered through uh, attending some Enchanted Evening. And I think a lot of our members are wanting to perhaps give more directly to the foundation so that the money can go more fully to towards helping students, uh, the, the full amount of it. So I think that's the direction we're gonna move as an association, and that's what I'm going to propose to um, to my members for, for our part that we give, um, that it go more directly to students through the foundation. Um, we've discussed a lot of the concerns with Banner 9, and you know we're just wanting to make sure that students and faculty can access all the information that they need to make you know, we, we get a lot of information from the old system and um, we want students to be able to find classes that they want and I, this is a huge, uh, it's a huge problem but it's also complicated and solving it's not gonna be easy and I think there's a lot of people all over campus working on this now. So that's something that we've still been discussing. Uh, we are having some discussions about shared governance and one of the big things, challenges to us that I should just make you all aware of is that um, you know, we've had faculty senate for about six years now, and we have struggled for the senate to figure out what their place is at the college, what their role is, what, it, what exactly does the senate do. And this has periodically been coming up um, over this whole time, and it, it's not been uh, sufficiently answered yet. So we're more intentionally entering into conversations with, between the Faculty Association and the Faculty Senate to figure out if there's a solution to that and what that would be. So that's something that's gonna be, um, that's happening sort of behind the scenes at this point, but um, I just wanted to make you all aware of it. If you, you know, stumble across what's going on here, um, that's something that we're trying to intentionally uh, manage now. Uh, we've, we're hearing a lot about different ways of communication. I know that um, the, um, Dr. McLeod's office has been working a lot on, with other folks on this campus to figure out ways that we can share information from maybe whether it's uh, the minutes of a committee, you know, what did they talk about when they met, how can people find this information, to just, you know, just freely accessing and sharing information. We, we, ha we don't have a lot of, um, you would think in this day and age we would have a clear way to do that, but it's, it's not that simple. And um, we always joke that if you put something in, 
an info share that you can never find it again unless you know it's there and so it's and where exactly it is. So um, just I think the college has been transitioning to some different ways of communicating. So that's going to be um, really important to share governance, I think, as well. Um, I am going to be so happy to tell my colleagues when they get back from spring break about uh, the decision that, with the HR committee's recommendations uh, that we ju you just voted on tonight. And this is, a, I think it's very important to valuing our employees, and there are a number of people that will be thrilled to hear uh, about this. You know, I think it's it's really in the best interest of everyone if someone is um, qualifies to retire, and if they are simply going to work for just a couple more years, only because of health insurance. Um, I think that this allows them to go ahead, have an option of of having resources to go ahead and retire. And I think it's in everyone's best interest if someone is ready to retire, wants to retire, and all that's stopping them is health insurance. Um, that This is gonna be a, tremendously valuable to a number of people um, on this campus, and it will directly impact everyone. It will directly impact our students. Um, and so I think it's huge. It's really big. So um, I just wanted to end with that just to say that um, I'm glad that you voted on that, and I'm very pleased to report some of these things back to, to the faculty when they return next week. Great. Yeah. I had a question. So the, the sick leave, so there was a discussion at one time, the difference between faculty sick leave, administration, sometimes one might take more than the other, and there was a difference in quality of why one might take more and why one might occur more. Can you explain a little bit more about why faculty may not be using those? Yes, yeah, so I think what you're talking about is we talked about a sick leave balances and the nine month folks tend to not use their sick leave um, at the same rate. And so, and what I was saying is that there have been many years where I didn't use all my personal days either. Some of that is just a, a factor of it's so much easier to just teach your class. <laughs> You have students wait, you know, counting on you to be there. You have something planned. It's a, it's a fine, it's a, like a, it's like dominoes. <laughs> Any little thing, and it, just like snow days are really hard to work around. It's really hard to work around being absent. And so, I think our our faculty tend to show up unless they just absolutely cannot show up. Um, if they can drag themselves here, it would be easier to teach their class than 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 call in sick. And even getting a substitute, which we do have that option here, is it's challenging to have, it's a lot of work. So when we go to conferences, people always say, man, just to get, be gone a day, it's like I have to work so much harder just to, you know, it'd be so much easier if I just taught my class. So um, I think that is a, a, an issue. And we don't always use our personal days either. We have, um, well, the first 10 years, you have two personal days a year. And then after that, you get, uh, well, actually, yeah. After that, you can convert sick leave into a personal day, so you could get a third one. Anyway, um, so, but it is, it is hard to take those even because your students are counting on you to come. So, does that answer your question? Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Dr. Harvey, thank you for being here thank this you. evening. Enjoy the rest of your spring break. <laughs> All right, um, Mr. Cross, Johnson County Education Research Triangle. Thank you, Madam Chair. The uh, Research Triangle is not met again this month. We'll meet next month on April 23rd. And that uh, concludes my report. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Kansas Association of Community College Trustees, Ms. Larson. Yes, there was a meeting that we had uh, in March. Now the time escapes me, I think it was on one of our forums here. Uh, in the morning, I did visit with 37 of our representatives, those are senators in State House uh, throughout our county that oversee us, and I brought them our annual report, and I went through the report if they were available. If not, I went through it with their assistant, and then just kind of caught them up on some of the things that we had done up in D.C. and some of the um, initiatives that we're looking for and hoping for course funding. And then finding out if there was anything specific that they had uh, that they would like us to address here at the college. And so I think that was a very uh, productive visit to go and, and talk to everyone as much as possible. Then our actual meeting that conducted was 
pretty much uh, twofold. There was an executive director search. Uh, so right now they've narrowed it down to about two uh, candidates. Uh, I did ask if KACCT had a diversity policy in their hiring practices, and they do not at this point, which is not in alignment with the National Organization of Trust, uh, Community College of Trustees. So I do hope that there's more discussion around lining up with the national organization at the state level. Uh, we did focus on a couple bills. Uh, they gave us a nice spreadsheet, pretty much that's similar to our legislative um, sheet that we got today with KBOR or a couple weeks ago. And the two that KACCT is really focused on, of course, is House Bill 2144. So that's Representative Christy Williams. She's a Republican in the 77th District. We heard a little bit about that from Dick Carter and the challenges around that and that some of those amendments were taken out. And then the other bill they were focused on is House Bill 2219 from Representative John uh, Acala, uh, de Democrat in the 57th District, and that is requiring bodies subject to the Kansas Open Meetings Act to record proceedings and make recordings available to the public. Now that did not get a uh, second sponsor, so we don't. that's pretty much dead. Um, but it might come back next session. So those are two things that uh, KACCT was interested in discussing. Um, one of the things I did find interesting is that JCC does help provide health care insurance as part of the group plan towards the KACC executive assistant. And I know she's non-employee, but, but having access to affordable health care is something I do believe is a right. So I think it's a good um, plan that, that that I think that was good that the college considered allowing people to opt in uh, because everyone should be covered. And KACCT is uh, promoting public education throughout the state of Kansas, uh, which includes a lot of community colleges that are really poor and don't have services. Uh, so as JCCC is a larger entity, um, we also kind of have a little bit of a responsibility to make sure the educational welfare um, of our entire state is something that we uh, address as well. Um, and then healthcare for all is important, and I'm interested in whether we can reevaluate or evaluate extending that same kind of benefit towards JCCC board members uh, and students. It's one where I had concerns about it at first after reviewing and hearing uh, that, but I do know that KACC team now pays full cost. Um, I think that is something that maybe board members and students may be able to do as well. Um, because full cost on a large plan is by default less than full cost in a situation where you are the only one on a plan um, because you get the group rate of everyone. And at least giving people that option to consider it, I think is something worthwhile and to uh, evaluate in the future. Um, I think that um, it's also important that we have a rubric that evaluates the cost to benefit of some of the memberships that our colleges pay for. Many of these organizations that we're members of charge us very high amounts for the amount of enrollment and students that we have. Um, and because of, uh, I think that's valuable in the, to make sure that we're investing in these organizations, but that they provide an equal return um, for our membership that we provide. I think in developing maybe a rubric that measures whether our investment is successful is crucial in raising the standards of these organizations to meet our needs. Um, I do would like to make a motion, if possible, to, uh, Madam Chair, to commission a study of the cost-benefit analysis of all our memberships to these outside organizations. Um, I think that is something that's important that we need to evaluate to make sure that what we're spending out there is actually giving us the return. Do I have a second? I... I, I can't second a motion if that's ambiguous. I don't have any idea how broad that would be. I would appreciate an, it, it very, very much if you'd bring that to the administration and look at it. The only, the only organization I know of that where we pay based on attendance or students is KACCT. Um, this board has talked about that for years, trying to evaluate the cost benefit analysis, which proves to be a very difficult, uh, difficult thing to to reduce to a spreadsheet or a rubric. Um, so again, I, I, I think this can be handled in ways other than to give a carte blanche to, a, to commission a new study um, at the board meeting. If I can, real quick. Um, 
it's, we pay, we have quite a few memberships across campus. I mean, literally in the hundreds here. Um, KACCT, AACC, um, League for Innovation, all of these, I believe the price is based on our enrollment. Yeah. And so, and also those come out of, I believe, the trustees budget, isn't that correct? So uh, what we'll do is we can lay those out <clears throat> and we can put their costs down, what it, what it costs the college, and then we can also lay out some of the pros and cons with each of those organizations. Um, again, those are limited to the college as a whole and they're out of the trustees, the trustees budget. Um, as far as the other ones, it would be a much more gargantuan task to, to address those. But I think it's a good starting point to look at those, um, those major ones like that. I think I'd like to uh, maybe then retract the motion if the administration will take that. Um, if we can add to make sure what the cost is, the amount of attendance to those organizations, um, if there's a satisfaction uh, survey of those people who are attending, if we can find out if they feel that those are valuable or are they just attending because they're required, uh, I think those would be helpful. Okay. That's fine. All right. Madam Chair, that seems to me a perfect task to go through the management committee since we have a committee structure to, to look at that as opposed to trying to do that at the board level initially. Okay. Thank you. Be my suggestion. All right. That concurs my report. Okay, thank you. I mean, my concludes my report. Good. All right. Um, the last report is from the foundation. Mr. Musel. Uh, the foundation executive committee met this past Tuesday and received an update from Emily Behrman on the new Carlson Center Presents series, as well as updated ticketing strategies that will be implemented this spring. On Wednesday, March 20th, the first meeting of the Summit Enchanted Evening Steering Committee took place to begin planning for the 33rd annual gala, which will be this November. <clears throat> Mr. Frank Devisell, who retired in on December 31st, I think, is the CEO of Olathe Health Systems, will be has been named the 2019 Johnson County of the Year. He'll be honored at the event. Mike and Susan Lally are serving as the co-chair of the event, and Pam Pop is leading the sponsorship committee. Just a reminder to everybody that the trustee reunion lunch um, will be held on Thursday, April 25th, during the Hospitality Management Luncheon in Wiley Academy from noon to one, followed by tours of the Fine Arts and Design Studios. And hopefully we'll, it'll be fun to see a lot of former trustees that are still around the area. And then the following day on April 26th, the foundation will host, host its annual luncheon in conjunction with the ribbon cutting for the Fine Arts and Design Services Building. Uh, the luncheon will be 1130 to one with the dedication of the FADS building immediately thereafter. That's all I have. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Musil before we... Can we play paper, rock, scissors to see who gives the report? I mean, why do you always have to give the report? I will, I will lose to you gladly. <laughs> you can give it every time. Well done, sir. Well done. All right. Um, the final, we are at the point where we have the consent agenda, and I would accept a single motion to approve the consent agenda, unless someone has a question regarding any of those pieces that you would like to discuss. Move for the consent agenda. Second. second. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. All in favor say aye. Yes. Aye. aye. Oh, same sign. Motion carries. We do not have an executive session this evening, so unless anyone has any further comments, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Should oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Mr. Lindstrom. I, I have a comment. Yes. Nice job, Madam Chair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, waiting for that motion to adjourn. So moved. <laughs> Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carried. We are adjourned. Did she second a motion?